Hi, I'm Marion Ellis, and this is the Surveyor Hub podcast, the podcast for surveyors who just love what they do. In this podcast, you'll hear from surveyors of all flavours, businesses of all sizes, and also conversations with people working in the business of surveying, supporting the work we do. We'll be chatting about what matters in our work, our career journeys, and learning how surveyors make a social and physical impact every day through their work. Don't forget to rate, review, and follow the podcast, or pop over to Google and leave us a review. You can also show your support at buymeacoffee.com forward slash the Surveyor Hub. Today on the podcast, I'm chatting to my dear friend and colleague, Larry Russon from Kings Lynn. Some of you may know Larry from Allied Surveyors, Russon and Turner, or Blue Box Partners. And many of you have probably attended at some point one of his training sessions or read some of his books or papers. Welcome to the podcast, Larry. Hello. Hello. And good morning, Marion. So where where on earth do I start with a podcast with Larry, the great Larry Russon? Do you feel like the great Larry Russon? You've got quite a reputation and the alphabet after your name, I think it's fair to say. Do I feel like? No, of course not. Of course I have imposter syndrome because most of what I might have achieved in life has simply been achieved through luck and through being really lucky to be associated with some really good people in my personal life, my professional life. Most of it is luck. So no, and and I often think when I'm standing up, as I was yesterday in front of um, 60 surveyors from Allied Surveyors, and I I was telling them about non-traditional housing, and I'm thinking, why on earth am I standing here? And and I think most of it is just the fact that I've got, I suppose, the balls to do it. I don't actually know much more than anybody else. I've just got a certain ability to stand and um, throw a few jokes in. Put some photographs on a on a on some slides because surveyors love photographs and be able to tell a half decent story. So the great Larry Russon, I'm not sure that's that's. I, right, I did but... I did wonder if it was because you were the oldest in the room. Oh well, that's um well okay that's it. I'm ringing off now. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you know? Uh, so so uh, over the last three or four months, somebody has been uh, telling me I'm very very old. So uh, uh, yeah. I suppose if you're able to survive, then eventually you you will become great in the sense that you've always been around. And so you'll always know a little bit about property. But um, yeah, possibly we can put great in single quotation marks. Okay. I think now, though, more than ever, we need people like you to be visible, to share what you know, and to offer, I guess, a layer of reassurance, because these are quite scary times for a lot of surveyors in terms of what on earth is going to happen to the property market? Will we be getting claims? What's going to happen to our small businesses? Uh, will we even get qualified for all of the students out there? You know, And then you've got whatever's going on with the world economically and will we be cold this winter? So as we're recording this now, we're just, um, just at the end of uh, November. And so there's a lot of uncertainty and there's quite a few surveyors you know, that I come across who've never been through rocky times in property. We've had it quite good for the last 10, 15 years, give or take. So I think we need more people to to be about and to to share some of that experience in a blitz spirit. <laughs> you can get through this, which is part of the reason, I mean, apart from you, you know, being a dear friend and good to, to have you on and chat about lots of different things. But I think it's also important to to share some of that as well. So tell me a bit about how you got started as a surveyor. Well, before I do that, I'm gonna just gonna knock that blitz thing on the head. I was not there. I was not there in 1940. I wasn't even a twinkle in anybody's eye. So I wasn't there. But I think you're absolutely right. But when I drove over to talk to Ally yesterday, I took my daughter with me because with a first in English and history from Leeds, naturally she's decided to become a surveyor and she's she's now just begun the Sava course. And um and I'm very aware of the fact that as I said to you just now, I'm lucky that I was mentored, even though when I started, it wasn't called mentoring. I was mentored by some really, really good people. And, I, and I've continued to be right the way up to present day by some really good people. And so, yeah, I've been through four recessions. I know that you can get through it with the right attitude. I know that you can get through it. I know that we will get through it, but I also know that that getting through a recession can be really difficult and can be 
very, very challenging. And so if there's one thing that helps you get through, I think it's communication and talking to people and don't sit there worrying. Don't worry about that letter of complaint that comes in and think, oh, I mustn't talk to people about it or they'll think I'm an idiot. No, we've all been there. I was chatting to a solicitor the other day and I could hear in his tone he was thinking, he was thinking, or he does think at times, wow, I wish I'd chosen a different profession or wish I was just ch- stacking shelves at Sainsbury's and, and didn't have all the responsibility of being managing part in this great firm. So talk to people. How did I get started? Do you know what? I uh, A mate of Mike Stern, who, who also became a surveyor, he and I were chatting one day in the sixth form common room, and we agreed that uh, it'd be great to do a job that meant that we weren't sat, sat in an office all day. And I said, oh, got any ideas? And he said, yes, surveying. So we naturally thought that would be standing in a field with a theodolite and not sat in an office. And so we both went into surveying. And and that really was how I got into it. I I later discovered I had a a chartered quantity surveyor, a distant relation working. He'd worked on airfields during the war. So he'd laid lots of concrete. But I, I tried to I don't tell people that because, you know, who wants to be related to a quantity surveyor? (laughs) Um, And I, and and I just, and I just sort of fell into it. And I, and as I say, I've been lucky. I'm, I seem to be halfway decent at it. And, um, and I really enjoy it. And I'm still some 44 plus years later after qualifying in 1978, I'm still enjoying it. And you're out doing inspections, aren't you? You know, not just sort of doing the, speaking and writing books and all the other things that you do, you're actually out there doing some yeah. stuff. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So so I'm still doing building surveys, level three reports. <clears throat> you must, um, where is it? Where is it? I, I keep, I keep clutched to my, here it is, very worn. Very worn survey cause I, standards. Because I take it, I take it to bed and read it and it's sort of falling apart now. And it's the it original is. copy that Anna Bajri gave me at RICS Surveys in Practice to thank me for what little I'd uh, contributed. But, um, <laughs> yeah, sorry, what what was the point? I've forgotten. So I was saying <laughs> about you going out doing in, inspections oh, yeah, yeah. still. Yeah, so level three reports, level two reports, schedules of dilapidations, expert witness reports. Unfortunately, I've just got, got into a potential boundary dispute, which is more actually to do with drainage and, and tree roots and party walls. So I do quite a lot of party wall work, member of the faculty of party wall surveyors. So, yeah, I'm, I'm still full time. Uh, uh, my youngest is 11. Horatio is 11. George is 13. So they've got. Um, so while the two girls, one has finished and, and the other is in her second year at Nottingham, George and Horatio are going to need help getting through getting through unis. So I'll be working for a few more years yet. And as I say, happily, still really, really enjoy it. I love the training. Love the training. Really do so enjoy let's, that. So let's just have a have a chat then. So you you decided to go into surveying. What did you do? A surveying degree in some way? Yeah. Was there a yeah, so I did course? A, I did a, a surveying degree at uh, what was then uh, the Polytechnic of the South Bank, now South, South Bank Uni. And um, worked for a couple of years for the Inland Revenue. Was uh, was that a, like a building surveying degree or no? No, no, no. That was, was um, that was estate management. Oh, we did the same. I did the same too. Oh, there you go. There you go. No, it was it quite nice and nice and broad, broad enough yes. to get yeah, into very, different things. Very broad, very very broad. And in some ways, I think that's quite good because that that enables you then to decide where are you going to zero in on. Where where will you? What would you specifically like? to do. And I chose to specialise in building surveying. So I did that a couple of years with the, with the DV, District Valuers, in East London, just to polish my accent, because that, that happens when you're working in West Ham, sorry, West Ham and East Ham and Stratford. Uh, and obviously, when you say that, you have to do it Stratford, right? And then decided to um, to move out of London, again, lucky enough to get a job with West Norfolk Council, only to discover Marion, after I, I came back from the interview and um, and I just mentioned to my mum, and lordy, lordy, I almost said something else there, discovered that my parents met in Kings Lynn. So a couple of people from the East End of London, mum and dad, met in Kings Lynn and they, they ended up picking uh, uh, strawberries, I think, at an ex-Italian prisoner of war camp in a village just down the road. And that's why... In a funny sort of way, when I came up for the interview, it, it almost felt like home. And it's certainly home now. So, yeah, life is full of little 
mm-hmm. little coincidences, synchronicities that you that you discover along the way that um, give you a nice warm glow in the heart. So were you doing valuation at the, at the time then for the council and for the district valuer? Was it or was it building surveying? Well, no, uh, like? D, D, DVs, it was primarily valuations for estate duty, as it was called then. The compensation work, enjoyed rating. And then when I came up to work for the council, it started to shift towards uh, not just commercial and residential valuation, but also some building surveying. And then I left them and I worked for a couple of years for a firm that, um, well, for Harry Hill, who uh, became the chief exec of, uh, or was it MD, of Countrywide. Countrywide. Yeah, not, yep. not the comedian, Harry Hill. <laughs> no, no, not, not Harry Hill, the comedian. No, Harry Hill, the surveyor, was very far mm. from being a comedian, but hell, he was, uh, he was very good at what he did. And then left there and set up on my own in uh, 1981. Okay. I want to ask you about your entrepreneurial journey and setting it by yourself. But can I just ask about CPD and training? Because you've just talked about different jobs that you've moved through. Did you go on any additional training courses? Was it all learnt on the job at the time? Well, be- becoming a chartered building surveyor, which I did very, very early on, was simply based on the fact that I was doing lots of survey work and lots of specification and design and contract management work. So eventually my work became sort of, at that time in the 80s, half of it was mortgage valuation work, which I really, really enjoyed because I think mortgage valuation work and, and, and also commercial valuation work is a massive intellectual challenge to mm. be able in a very short space of time, because that's governed to a certain extent by the fee, to enable to encapsulate in a in a very brief report the certainties that that the client needs in a valuation report is really really difficult to do the inspection in the time to overcome the challenges that are sometimes put there by by the jolly old vendors and then to get the report right is a massive massive challenge but then the other half of the work was um, was uh, survey work and um, and design and contract admin work. And in fact, there were two of us. So Peter Turner and myself, the the firm is Russell and Turner. Peter and I, what we would do to keep the interest going, one month, Peter would do all the the valuation work and I would do all all the survey and contract admin stuff. And then the following month, we'd swap. And I'd do the commercial valuation work and he'd do the opposite. And that actually was a really good way of operating. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, we did that for about 10 years and it really worked. I like the way you've described valuation there because I think I think valuers who do mortgage valuation get a, a rough ride. Sometimes it's seen as, you know, you're doing a quick job, run in, run out. No. You know, but it depends. Firstly, it depends on what you're comparing it to. It's not like survey work, you know, doing the building surveys, et cetera. It, it is very different. And you're right. You do have to be thinking it. I almost, maybe this is how my brain works, think of it as like a, a 3D matrix kind of, it's all this stuff <laughs> and you're smiling now uh, that's out there and you've got to sort of tune into it and pull it together. On the one hand, there's, you know, the data, the comps, but on the other hand, it, I find it very intuitive looking at, well, what will people pay and why would they pay and what is the, the difference? It's a very customer focus, which is perhaps sort of why I why I enjoy it. But um, you're right, it's it, it's not an easy job. And yes, there's lots of valuation claims, However, they're not all due to surveyor error. You know, if we think about, you know, my experience of the last recession, it was poor lending decisions and, mm. you know, just the the circumstances, you know, sometimes or, or the, the service that was provided rather than what the actual valuer did. And in my yeah. experience, there's very few claims where you can g- genuinely just blame the surveyor surveyor for it. So yeah. So tell me about your how you got started then with um with your own business then with with Pete Turner. Uh well I I I um I, I got to a point where um with the inevitable arrogance of youth, i.e. mid twenties, well I can do this, can't I? I can do this myself. And um and I quite like to do it myself. And so I set up uh, literally with again with the help of a friend and uh, a mum's old typewriter. So she she gave me her old typewriter, and uh, with uh, Barclay Card, uh, I bought a tape measure, a moisture meter, and a ladder and a torch, and that was the content of my surveyor's bag. 
And then with uh, a loan that was backed by a friend, another chartered surveyor, bought a, bought a car, an old VW variant from East, East Germany, and just went and spoke to the local building society managers and said, uh, give us a job. And, and the first one I was given, uh, he walked it round to me at nine o'clock uh, in the morning and he had the report in his hand at 11.15. So I made sure that they understood that I could do the job, but also I could do the job uh, in a, a relatively reasonable time frame. Uh, and I still remember the look on, on uh, it was Graham, Graham Butcher. Still remember the look on his face as I brought, as I brought it back. He said, he said, what's the, what's, what, what, sorry, what, what, what is it? What's the problem? And I'd literally driven four miles down the road to a village called West Winch, driven back, completed the report, and I handed it to him. And, um, I got all his work from then on, and I just went through. You you see, now that rings alarm bells for me in terms of reflective thought. Yeah, because uh, because, uh, back in 1980, whenever it was, uh, there was no guidance. There There was no guidance from that particular bank. The comparables, we did it totally differently. It was all up here back then. And, in fact, it wasn't, it was handwritten. The report was handwritten. They were happy with a handwritten report because the they surveyor, weren't released. Yeah, there'll be surveyors listening now thinking doing a job with no guidance. Yeah. Comps out of thin air. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and you know, sometimes people say, what have the RICS et al. ever done for us? Well, actually, they've given us this framework that we can use and protect us and others. But yeah, so, wow. Yeah. So look, back, back then you had RICS guidance. We all knew the RICS guidance because only an idiot wouldn't read the guidance. I, I still come across surveyors who haven't read this. The Home Survey Standard, yeah. What? You haven't read it? So we all knew the guidance and we all we all knew the market. We were very close to the market. The, the, the market was, was pre the internet. So we, we were very close to all the estate agents. We, we chatted the whole time and we just knew – intuitively were selling for because we knew the one down the road had gone on the market at well back then 11750 and had sold at 11250 so we were doing the job in the same way uh, what we didn't have was the ability to grab a file and say look here are all my co- comparables and, and this is my reflective thought but we engaged in that reflective thought and we knew what the comparables were and, um, yeah, we scribbled them down on the file. But so far as the file was concerned, you'd be lucky if there was more than three pages in it. The original instructions, the site notes with the comparables scribbled on and the, and the measurements and the single A4 report. Oh, and the fourth one, of course, the really important bit, the fee, the £27.50 plus VAT for the report. Oh, it just makes me shudder. So, how did that pan out then? With with the like, was there a recession afterwards and claims? Because do people claim, you know, or have complaints then? If you got clearly, I mean, from a, I'm looking at it from a, you know, my experience of dealing with claims, there's nothing better than getting a file with some information in that you can actually use. But if yeah. you've got very little to go on, then I mean, well, was I, it even I, the same claim c- culture? Well, again, in the in in the eighties, as as time progresses, and the and the and the surveying culture changes, then one understands the need for reflection, and one understands the need to have more information to back up your valuation, your opinion of value, and uh, and I don't want you to think, by the way, that I was returning every report within two and a half hours. <laughs> I was just absolutely. This was the first instruction I yeah, got, yeah. and by hell, I was going to get that. Yeah. I was going to get that back quick because I, I needed uh, I needed to get some income coming in, and within two and a half months, I had more work than I could shake a stick at. And indeed, for about eighteen months, I was working pretty much seven days a week. But as as the eighties went on, we were as a profession, we were becoming more aware of the need. Uh, certainly because of uh, potential complaints and claims, although uh, I have to say didn't get a complaint or or any hint of a claim for 10 years. You understand the need to record the information so that you can later on return to it, not ju- not, not primarily to, to defend yourself uh, uh, and not for audit purposes because we didn't know what the word audit meant anyway. 
but just to go be able to go back and use that file as a comparable. You so you started your business, started getting this work in. What was it like running a business at that time? Did you find it quite pressured? Uh, well, no, because what you don't know, you don't know. So you don't realise that um, that when you start a business, there is a significant responsibility to yourself, your family, but primarily to to clients. You're just buoyed, I think, by by the buzz. And as I say, I was working every hour that was sent by the Almighty for a significant period, built up a, a nice stash of cash in the bank, had a really good accountant who enabled me not to pay any tax. For th- I think it was three years I didn't pay any tax. All legal, all legal, <laughs> uh, obviously. O- obviously, your uh, uh, commissioners, commissioners of inland revenue, it was all legal. Uh, and I now look at people who set themselves up in practice, and, and I realized, again, that I was really lucky. I had a really good business network, really good people supporting me, other professionals, lawyers, other surveyors, because I was heavily involved in RICS, Building Surveyors Division, and the East Anglian branch, as it was then. So I had loads of help from people. And um, and really, there was no manual to follow. Just just got stuck in and just, and just did it and learnt along the way. Whereas now, I think that there's a lot more help available uh, and, uh, and a lot more guidance, primarily because of the internet. There, there is... But also people don't always take it up. No. And it, you're right. It's absolutely about your network, who you know, who you get to support, how you support yourself. And there's lots of information on the internet and out there as to how to start a business, what you need to do. What I see, though, is people look for a business out of a box, you know, kit, which I never give people. Because I think you've got to learn what your business is like. Now, yes, there's sort of regulatory things that you have to do and, you know, a bit of a, a framework depending on, on what your business is. But if you don't know your business and the way that you show up in your business, then you can't make the right decisions for you. And I see a lot of people go straight into it with very little support. They don't talk to many of the surveyors or they sign up to, you know, a franchise scheme or a panel arrangement or they think they're just thinking about the money when they're not thinking about how am I as an individual going to do this, look after my family, keep the mortgage, the roof over my head, you know, they've got to look at it, things as holistically. And ultimately, they end up getting burnt out or the tap of their work gets switched off. But because they've never learned to generate their own work in any way, shape or form, they're left high and dry. But I think everybody comes to a point in their business where you start, you're on that buzz that you talked about, and then something happens or you get like a reality check in some ways. And that's when you realize how far you've come. You have to then reassess and then work out where you're you're going next. So it sounds like it was a quite a successful start. Has it always been a successful business or has there been tough times too? Uh, well, yeah, after 18 months, I did reach that point where I was getting to be burnt out. And so I advertised and um, had some really good applicants and, uh, and, and Peter Turner joined me. And um, we worked uh, really well together. In many ways, we're a little bit chalk and cheese. I learned a hell of a lot from him. And then we, uh, and then Rob Drury joined us, another good, really good charter building surveyor. And he started working out of um, what we called the Wisbeach office, i.e. his uh, living room. And then, uh, so we'd gone through, so we went through a recession in the 80s. Can't remember exactly when it was. And then another recession turned up, early 90s. And we decided to not only do valuation surveys and design of pretty much every type of property, but also get into residential and then lastly, commercial agency. So with the money that we got from a fairly large surveying contract with a housing association, we bought some premises in the high street. We poached some really good negotiators from Royal Sun Alliance. I'm sorry, they decided to join us. Obviously, we didn't poach them. That would be un- unprofessional. And and got agency going. And, and because we set it up in the middle of a recession, we knew we could do it. And so when we came out of recession, in fact, I do remember lots of people talking to me and saying how clever I'd been at uh, setting up in in the bottom of a recession. Well, no, I wasn't. I just decided, we just decided to do it because we knew we could do it. 
And only later on did we realise that it had been quite clever. And then we eventually got to five offices it, it, by the time we turned the corner of uh, 2000. But then we, we were hit by the by the really big recession into, when was it, 2007? And from 38 people and five offices, we we had to shrink. Awful, awful period. Very, um, very stressful. Back down to one office and 18 people. Wow. So, so we've seen it up and down, been successful in the sense that we've survived. I often think that um, that life is about survival and just survival is, is success because you learn so much along the way. And I think that's it. You've got to constantly be adjusting what you need in the environment that you're currently in. Whereas I see a lot of surveyors think, well, I'm going to expand and I'm going to have all these people. And you think that is never a sustainable model or plan because you get curveballs thrown at you. you know, yes, you can aspire to great things, but you can earn more money and be more successful with less people if you work smarter. You know, And, and I see this actually with, with some one-man bands where they think about hiring someone, but as soon as you get to employ people, you've got a whole other raft of regulations, employment law and, and things like that. So there's you've got to be thinking about different ways you can achieve the, the, the same thing. What I've learned in private life and, and um, at and professional life is before you make those sorts of decisions, always ask yourself why and what do you actually want to achieve? What, why do you want to be a bigger firm? Why do you want to take on more people? What, what is the purpose? What, what is your goal? Because as you say, there are, there are all different sorts of ways to, um, to skin a cat. I, I don't suppose you're, we're allowed mm-hmm. to, to use that analogy anymore because we'll get complaints in from the Cat Protection League. But there's always different ways, and uh, and so I, I I always now ask myself why 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 do I want to achieve that, and what will the results be? What I see is a lot of surveyors do not know any other model than a corporate model, and so they just become mini corporates. Mm. And I don't know whether it's a masculine thing or whether they've just not got themselves involved and in learning about different types of businesses. You don't need to go to business school to learn this stuff. It's just, you know, I'm sure from your networking and getting to know different people, you'll see, you know, lots of different size and shapes of businesses, how they operate. And that really enriches you. And it's then having the confidence to say, well, I'm going to be a surveyor in my own way and work this way because this is what works for me. Whereas I think for a lot of people I see starting up, you know, certainly in the last sort of, you know, five years or so, it's this sort of standard type of model and they're not yes. experienced enough in the surveying industry or even giving themselves permission to do things a bit differently. Yeah. I, 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 one of the things I learned along the way, and I always recommend this to people, is a book and it's been revised, I think, by a chap called Michael Gerber, G-E-R-B-E-R, the E-Myth. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, the myth being that, well, just because you might think or even be a halfway decent surveyor or architect or solicitor or whatever it is, doesn't mean that you're a halfway decent business person. Uh, and I certainly have significant challenges, i.e. failings, as, as a business person. But, um, yeah, I would recommend that book. I was always quite lucky again. I'm fairly open. I think most people can read me. And so I was always willing to talk to my mates that I'd met through networking groups, through Roundtable, the solicitors, the bank managers, uh, the accountants, uh, and, and talk to them and, uh, and just say, look, how the hell do I do this? Because I haven't got a clue. And they'd help. Of course they do, because if you ask most people, they'll help. Most people will help you if you ask for it. Most people give. Most of us are givers. And we say, you know, there's no such thing as a stupid question, but you've still got to ask. And what I see is a lot of say is going straight into every piece of CPD and technical knowledge there is, and yet they don't do anything to support them in running their business, you know, work-life balance, whatever you know, you know, it is, you know, or they think they can do the marketing, set up a website. It's like, well, anyone can set up a website, but there's like the copy you've got to write, the marketing, the look and feel, the and there are people who specialize in this stuff. You know, and it's almost as though we're blind to that uh, sometimes. So let's talk about technical competency. I want want to ask about this because I want to know how you got into training. And I know you've been involved in claims and and, and things before. So you must have seen the best and worst of surveyors, I guess, over the years. Yeah. So so in the 90s, 
uh, again, uh, 1990 it was. In that year, I still remember the figures. As a firm, we had fees come in from the Halifax of uh, £25,000. And then the recession hit. And also there'd been some really big fraud cases run by estate agents and solicitors and uh, surveyors. And they'd all got together. And, and all the lenders had said, uh, well, one, it's not very economic for us to manage 500 firms on our panel. And two, all these little firms, that potentially they, they could be more prone to, um, to diddling us, to fraud. So they started to go to the bigger firms. Uh, and so as a practice, our, our income from uh, mortgage valuations dropped. So the Halifax, for example, one year it was 25 grand, the next year it was 1,000. So we looked around and again, as a result of contacts through RICS in East Anglia, it just so happened that uh, Allied Surveyors contacted us. Uh, and so we joined Allied. And at that time, uh, Allied was nowhere near the sort of um, absolutely professional firm that they that they are now and didn't have a full-time uh, technical director and certainly not the sort of technical director that Pete Folds is now and, and before him, Chris Rispin. Uh, and, and so I got involved in giving a bit of advice, mainly on building surveying, and and then I got roped in to delivering some training at various meetings and AGM. Uh, and eventually, a chap who uh, joined Russell and Turner and had a, an educational background listened to me at one of these events and said, do you know, you're sort of all right at this. Some of your jokes are a bit, um, a bit were, but, um, but you're all right. Uh, you ever thought of doing a, an educational qualification? So I went off and did a postgraduate certificate in education, uh, enjoyed that. And then I also got involved in Sava. So I've been involved in Sava from the beginning, 1999, and met all sorts of really good people like Hilary Grayson, that bloke Parnham, met him there. Chris was on the um, committee that uh, was set up to really try to knock surveyors into shape, sorry, help surveyors into shape, following on from a rather interesting program in 1999. Was it World in Action? Can't remember. I think I'm mixing up my... Was it mine. Panorama? It was Panorama, wasn't it, where they the, they took a, a, a house in South London and like invited... The Malcolm Hollis one. And they were advised by Malcolm on that, and they yeah. got 10 surveyors around. I'll yeah. put a link to the show notes on that, because yeah. Malcolm talks about that in the podcast. Yeah, yeah. They, took, they, they got 10 surveyors around, uh, and in 22 minutes uh, uh, of a half-hour programme, uh, one of the surveyors... Uh, I think his ladder collapsed, and another was uh, pictured sitting on the bed bemoaning the fact that he was a surveyor. Anyway, they absolutely ripped it out of surveyors, and that, I think, really prompted uh, the, the formation of Sava, and I was lucky enough, again, to be involved, and, um, and I've been training ever since. Do you think, and this is something that, that worries me these days, the quality of what's going on out there in surveyors, surveying with people doing surveys, I worry about whether that's good enough and if it, is it being regulated enough and checked enough you know we've got a we've got a standard you know which helps people um, and also you know, you know comparing to what you what you started out, out with you know whatever membership body in whichever way you're doing surveying because obviously it's not just just the RICS you know there, there's standards there's guidance there is a the support there but I don't see well two things one who audits the auditors how do we know those rules are the right rules? Are they being tested? Are we monitoring complaint and claims numbers to see that the rules and guidances that we've created are right? And also, who is checking the work that's being done to make sure it's fit for purpose? Because from an, an RICS point of view, we're there to act in the public advantage. And so, therefore, we've got to make sure the quality is there. Now, with a larger firm, you'll have some kind of audit function, largely because you need that for the lender work that you might be doing. But I don't necessarily see that with the smaller or medium-sized firms. And I see some awful things. And I worry about the next TV program or, you know, um, YouTube video of surveyor going round, but also then when you compare it to the report that gets churned out, you know, and what their expectation is. And I, I, I worry about that. I worry about the next surveyor hiding in a cupboard telly with a, with a TV programme. Yeah. And, and following on from that 1999 TV programme, what I very often say in training is assume that on every job, there is a camera in every room. When you go in to do that inspection, be the property occupied or not, 
uh, assume that you're being filmed. So how and they would do you sometimes like... actually because people have CCTV. You know, oh, absolutely, the, and and, and I and I think you and I both uh, have we ever discussed the case where somebody was filmed? Uh, yes, it wasn't that good. So as, assume that you're being monitored. How do you want to be? How do you want to be seen as a professional? Bearing in mind, as you say quite rightly, RICS is not a trade union. The whole purpose of RICS is is to serve the public, is to serve the population of the United Kingdom. And I always think now bearing in mind climate change, potentially every sentient being on this on this planet, RICS has a responsibility towards. And that's why they look at being an international organisation. Mm. They have the Royal Charter. And it's mm. in the UK, it's very linked to um, valuation in our economy because you have to be a registered valuer to do that kind of work. But that's where absolutely you've got to look at the bigger picture and how do we bridge the gap between what's going on globally and a surveyor on a wet Tuesday in Margate. We need to be curious about that. Yeah. It's also got to be practical and we can talk a lot about yeah. how ICS or not and, and where they're, they're at with things. Do you get that sense that quality might not be uh, what it could be or we could tighten the rules in any way given well, you, if you look at If you look at the code of, code of ethics and you look at those five codes of ethics. I think there's uh, six now. Oh, are there, oh, there's six. Oh, I think right. Six, I, they changed yeah, in you're, February. I think you're right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Those, those uh, ethic, ethics. <laughs> Yes, yeah. those codes, are, yeah, that code of ethics. Mm-hmm. I looked at them the, only the other day, so it just goes to show what um, age does to your me- memory. Then uh, what we should be doing, what we should be trying is on every job, on every commission, as a member of a profession, because that's what we are, uh, and I do get a little bit ratty with people who describe us as being in, in an industry. I think you might have done that, actually, Marion. So. I do it quite I do it quite a lot. And every time yeah. I say it, I think Larry would say profession. <laughs> and I also say, you know, in the business of surveying, whereas some people are, we're a practitioner. Whatever uh, works. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, whatever. Wh- whatever, whatever. We are professionals and, and we should we should try. And I don't achieve this every time. I do not. I'm not perfect. Uh, even though I always strive, uh, and I decided early on, I would strive to be the best chartered building surveyor in the world. That's always been my aim. We should try to do the level best that that, that we can, and be it in a on a wet Tuesday in Margate, or even worse in Wisbeach. So, sorry, Rob. Then we have to accept the fact that that we as surveyors get cold. And and yes, I I see some reports and I hear some stories. And you and I have discussed, as you know, on our WhatsApp group, we all discuss what we know is going on. And and there are horrendous stories. And I heard one only the other day of a surveyor doing a home buy report, a level two report in 40 plus minutes, not taking any photos, not making any notes whatsoever, not going into the roof space. There are some horrendous things that get done. And so And so on every job, on every job that I do, what I try to do is comply with that document because that document is written. Home survey standards. Yeah, the home survey standard is written by some really good people and it's a really good standard. Okay, it's not perfect and that isn't because Phil wrote most of it, but it's a really good document. And so my files, our files are set up in such a way so as to try to complete it. And so that means... If that inspection has to take six hours and that report has to be 50 pages, then that's just it. And you have to, and if you have to stay longer at the property than you, you've anticipated, and if you have to stay until seven, okay, taking into account work-life balance, if you've got to stay until seven in the office to complete that report, that's just what flows from being a professional. The whole point of being a professional is you're not the important person in the equation. You're not. Your client is. The UK general public are, the population of the planet are. You come, you come forth after all of them. I agree with all of that. Where I worry is the gap between the rules yeah. and then what actually happens. Okay. And there's a lot of um, research on this in terms of health and safety and on the work of Sydney Decker, you know, why failure happens and why mistakes happens. And I, I see that from a my experience with complaints and claims, yeah. the surveyor never goes out to set to do a bad job, but sometimes the circumstances that they're in, the framework they're in, how they're feeling in themselves, 
mean that something gets missed or they make a decision or sometimes you know and and there's i think there's lots of research on this with um with pilots you know the they've got quirks you know they'll uh, i read something it might have been uh, matthew syed in um black box thinking might have been where they put um a plastic cup over the gear stick to remind them to do or not do something and that's the kind of thing that you don't get in a standard or or an employee manual in in some way which is why I worry about, you know, someone doing an inspection in that way. Yeah. Is anybody checking the quality of the report, what the public and consumers are getting? Um, but also then how do we call it out? Now, as we're recording this, um, we've just had the news um, over the last week about the little boy who died because of mould inhalation in a, a yeah. the Rochdale Housing Association property. But, you know, I also think about the little girl who died due to air pollution a couple of years ago. And then you've got the whole Grenfell situation. We do, as surveyors or whatever we do in the construction industry, we all do this this little part. But we are all in the business of helping somebody live well in that property. Mm-hmm. And I I have concerns that we can't always call these things out. We don't think of the holistic job at hand. We just look look at our parts or we look at the technical parts, you know, and then you get dreadful situations like that that happen. I think, Marion, that that again, this is why I'm I'm so sniffy about the word profession, because regulation, in my view, needs to start with self-regulation. And we need to look at ourselves. The whole point about professional reflection, it's the, it should be the equivalent of what we, you and I are doing. I've got a little picture of myself at the top of the screen, so have you. Reflection is looking at yourself and deciding whether or not you've done the best possible job that you can for that member of the public who is relying on that advice. Because if that advice that you give them isn't good enough, then potentially you have adversely affected their life. So if you start with self-regulation, and I've, I've pretty much, I've always done this. I've, it's just the way that I am. I always think, am I good enough? Is that report good enough? But I think a lot of surveyors, they just need some help. They just need some help. And so how can they be regulated? You and I know that most, well, pretty much all level three, level two reports they're not regulated and nobody is looking at those reports. And so it could well be that what RICS needs to think about, what we, because where are, we are RICS, what RICS needs to think about possibly is um, not just regulations of um, regulation of evaluation work, but survey work as well. And do you know what? I dealt with a, a negligence claim on a level three report a few months ago. And this report wasn't up to standard. And the surveyor who was involved, he or she could well have uh, have thought, following my joint sole expert report, well, all right for Larry to be clever after the event. What a swine saying those things about me. No, I spoke to him. He called me. He called me and, and said, thank you very much. And on one particular point, how do you address the issue, Larry? And we had a really good chat and he's gone away now. And I hope, well, I know that he's gone away now reflecting, as he should, having had a complaint, and that his reports now are going to be better as a result of that of, of that reflection. And I'm exactly the same. When I'm at a CPD do, I listen, uh, and when I read other people's reports and when I'm chatting to them, every day is a learning day. And I, and I'm, I can always go back to my 130,000 words of standard paragraphs and I can always tweak those and improve them. And, um, and so, yeah, just, just in terms of process, perhaps we do need to accept that as surveyors on level two and level three reports, we should be having that a certain number of them called in for auditing by RICS every year. I, yeah. I, you've raised a couple of really interesting points there. You know, it's a mammoth task to uh, to audit everybody because everyone does it ever so slightly differently. How do we self-regulate? How do we learn to do that? You know, a lot of business owners I meet, they can't even balance their books. You know, they don't do, uh, you know, have any rhythm and pattern to their, their business and work and, you know, uh, work week and month but that's where you've got to build in those those checks but also i think when you work for yourself or a small company you don't always do things like peer-to-peer reviews Mm. or read anyone else's reports and i guess you and i with dealing with claims and and things we've got to see a broad 
you know, range of different types, whereas a surveyor's working by themselves, always in silo, using their favorite paragraphs, doing the things that they they want to do and say, you know, and we've got to be much wider to it. So it's a great point, you know, actually, can how can any membership body go down into that detail? We've got to do it, attack it from both sides. Because ultimately, whilst you can learn from a claim, it's actually someone's had to suffer Mm. either physically mentally financially had to suffer for you to learn that so there's there's a lot that we can do in terms of being proactive and target cpd based on that rather than just showing up to fancy do's larry <laughs> cpd days <laughs> with fancy yeah. 80 pound ties from uh, from a very swiss shop in cambridge um mm. yeah i i, I think I, well that's why the surveyor hub is so good isn't it because we can all learn from each other because what is the Surveyor Hub about? It's about communication. And, and to a certain extent, we can all be, be open about that and, and not judgmental when people are asking what you might potentially think is a silly question. No, no question is silly. They've asked that question because they don't know. So let's all hope, let's all help. And, and on the CPD side, because you're absolutely right, you, you don't want to have to learn through claims because somebody has suffered. That person to whom you owe that duty has suffered. I think possibly a lot of surveyors think that that uh, CPD is about how to do evaluation or or how better to do a survey. But perhaps we should be thinking more about how we act as professionals. Go back to those six codes of ethics and, and really drill down into those codes and decide and agree how we act as professionals, as members of the RICS. How should we as professionals? actually be professional in the way that we act so that instead of being, thinking that RICS is there to regulate us, the regulation starts from the inside and we just accept, do you know what? I do need I do need to have a chat with Andy Holford in the town here, who's a really good chartered building surveyor. Andy, please show me one of your reports. I'll show you one of mine. And we trust each other sufficiently so that you can point out the bits I've got wrong vice versa. We can do it over a nice cup of coffee, obviously at Cafe Nero. And um, and you know what? That helps us. But that's not the important point. The important point is it's helping the people that we serve, the general public. And it's like we need to get over ourselves yeah. and remember the yeah. business, the profession that we're yeah. in, which is to help people. And if that means we have to ask a stupid question, we have yeah. to have some extra checks and balances in, that's yep. why we're doing it rather and do it in a positive way yep. rather than, you know, be policed or regulated through yep. fear of getting it, getting it wrong. Being, being yeah. a member of RICS, being a, being a professional in any professional, it's not about us. It's not about us. That's why the charter is written in the way it is. It's about the people that we serve. We serve people and their lives rely on our reports. And so, where it starts is inside us. We've got to get it right. The, the massive responsibility that we've got starts inside us. So we need to regulate ourselves. We need to be become a, a, the best surveyor that we can possibly be so that we can provide the best possible advice to the people who rely on our, on our reports. And I think this is when I coach people, we, I often talk about or ask people, why did you become a surveyor? Because if you, you've got to understand what you're about you know, to uh, and that personal development side to then be able to do the technical side better. It goes Larry, back to what it goes back, Marion, to what you were talking about earlier. Sorry, interrupting you. Um, I do it all the time. About your, <laughs> about, about, but you're used to that. Uh, about your own internal culture. We talk about firms' cultures. That culture needs to start within ourselves. Our culture. Why are we doing it? What's it for? What's the point? Why? Best question you can ever ask yourself, why? And I'll think on that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Larry, do you know what? We've talked and it's just been amazing. We were going to talk about a load of other things, but I think, and, and I hope the surveyors have found, other surveyors have found that really, really useful. I think, I think they will, and I hope it, it offers some reassurance of just the things that we can do through our work and through our, our businesses, you know, as we go through a bit of a, a tricky time. I know you've got, you're always working on a book, aren't you? Oh, the yeah. latest book out, book out? Residential Property Appraisal, Volume 2, written by the highly intelligent Phil Parnham and me. I, I did the index. 
yeah, and that's uh, and that's just coming out. How many, just, volumes just, will there, how many volumes will there be all together? There's going to be three. There's going to be three. Uh, Phil, Phil um, turned the chapter on services into another book, which the publishers were really, really impressed with. So It'll be a sellout. It'll be a it'll sellout. Be a sellout. So the first one is the legal stuff and the valuation stuff. Second one is building pathology. Third one is services. Just want to say, yeah, look, it's going to be a really good book. It's going to be a really good book. Yeah, lovely. Great to speak to you, Larry. Thanks ever so much for your time. Likewise. Hey, thanks for tuning into the show today. I really hope you enjoyed it. You can find the show notes and links to any guests and resources we've mentioned today on the website, lovesurveying.com. And don't forget to show your support by buying me a coffee or you can rate, review and follow the podcast on your usual podcast platform. It really does make a difference and helps spread the word and reach a wider audience of surveyors who just love what they do. See you next time.